Hey, I hope you're all going to be here. But next Sunday, we're going to have all Christmas songs and no sermon. Did you ever hear something like that? I did this once before in, uh, where was that, in Tyrone? Freedens? <laughs> it was in one of the other churches we pastored. And I had kids, two kids, one each side of me reading in between the songs and following the following the Christmas story. And I mean, their cousins came, their aunt and uncle came, everybody came to see the, their, their mom took pictures of them sitting beside me over there. It was, all, it was really an exciting thing for them. We're going to do the same thing next week, except uh, I'm doing the reading myself. Unless somebody else wants to do that. Doctor, I have some bad news and some very bad news. The patient, well, might as well give me the bad news first. The lab called with your results. You have 24 hours to live. Patient says, 24 hours? That's terrible. What could be worse? What's the very bad news? Doctor says, I've been trying to reach you since yesterday. <laughs> You know, you got to be ready all the time. You got to be ready because you don't know. You're not guaranteed another heartbeat or another breath. You got to know. You got to be ready. Amen. Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. In the King James, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Would you bow your heads with me, dear Lord? Thank you for the opportunity to bring these morsels from your word into the family in this house today, Lord. And we pray that you will guide and direct this word, that it'll go where you want it to go, and it'll have the effect that you want it to have. And then we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, peace on earth. Glory to God and peace on earth is what it says, peace. But Christmas, for many, is anything but peaceful. As a child, I anticipated Christmas because I would get something, get a bunch of stuff. I tried to stay awake all night so I could get up as early as possible to tear in to the Christmas presents under the tree. We didn't do that with our kids. We had Christmas Eve and we still do the night before. And then they would let us sleep on Christmas morning. I didn't let my parents sleep. As soon as there was a little bit of dawn, this little bit of dawn coming through the window, I was in there, Mom, can we go down? Can we go down? Can we go down? <laughs> one year, I, one year to stay awake all night, I had a wet washcloth in addition. I kept putting it on my eyes to keep me awake. I really did that. I really did that. Yeah, I'm going to do it this Christmas, too. Just kidding. Just kidding. So we worshipped the activity of Christmas, you could say. We did it. Uh, we were worshipping Santa Claus. And we went to church on Christmas Day, on Christmas morning, but that was an obligation. In the Catholic Church, you have to go to Christmas, a church on Christmas, whether it's on Sunday or not, you have to go. That's an obligation. So it was something we went through, something to be endured. It wasn't a joyful thing. We wanted to get back home and play with our presents and eat turkey. So we knew about Jesus. You know, they taught us about Jesus in school. We went to the Catholic school. The Penguins taught us about Jesus. No matter what was said, at least for me, the reason for the season was presence. That was the reason. Giving presents, receiving presents, feeling good, cookies, decorations, turkey. And one of the best things was time away from school. No school for a whole week. That was, I hated school when I was a kid. I detested school. No school for a whole week. That was awesome. But for me, the celebration was all about the celebrators. Jesus was just an image. It was a familiar story. It was a real story. We did believe 
in Jesus, but not, but it wasn't relevant. We didn't make it relevant. We didn't wrap our hearts around it. We believed that Jesus came in a ba as a baby and, you know, it was a nice story, but it didn't really matter in a personal way. And I think most of the world is like that. I really do. Then I grew up. I got into a career. And I got saved. Jesus is relevant now. Jesus is the reason for this season. But I dreaded the season. I dreaded it. And here's why. Even though I was a believer, I dreaded that season. Because of frantic people. I was in the photography business. Frantic people. Every phone call. Where's my pictures? I'm using those pictures for Christmas presents. Where's my pictures? Every phone call. And we had a huge volume. And it was hard to get that stuff all out on time. My kids were sleeping in my studio in sleeping bags for a couple of nights so we could get out a delivery out on time. Frantic people. I delivered to Baldigo Nittany High School, you know, right up the road from Baldigo area, Baldigo Nittany. And it was, a, it was an ice storm. And I didn't know if the school would be open or not, but I started out and it was icy. The roads were really icy, it was dangerous. And I stopped at a, place where there was a phone booth and I called the school. Harold Adams, the president, the, the uh, principal, answered the phone. He said, and I said, well, I have these pictures and I'm on the way. I said, is the school open? He said, we're closed, but I'm here. And every phone call is about those pictures. He said, if you can get those up here, I'll see that they get delivered. I'll put out a, an announcement on the radio and people came and, and, you know, they would keep the money, the money that was due in a, in a safe for me. So I did that. Frantic people. I don't know if you can remember when the Logan Valley Mall in Altoona caught fire. Can anybody remember that? Do you remember that? Somebody said, mm -hmm. who said that? <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, what was that, 20 years ago? Yeah. 25? Good time, yeah. The Mountain Mal caught fire, and they had a big sale in there, and it was like 80% off in uh, some of the stores that were in there. And I can remember going over there and hearing people say, this is a godsend. It was a tragedy. Those businesses lost their inventory. And people thinking that was a godsend for them because they were going to get something cheap. That kind of, those kind of attitudes. You know, I was in Walmart the other day and a woman had a shopping cart. It was completely full. A lot of people did. Completely full of toys and clothes and stuff. And I looked at her and I thought, this woman doesn't have the money for all that stuff. She's going on a credit cards. 20% interest. It's going to take a whole year to pay that off. We've been there. We get out of that. It was hard to climb out of that. No more credit cards. You can always enticements on the phone and stuff. And then, you know, everywhere. Credit card, credit, credit card. No way. Forget the credit cards. Well, you just pay it off every month. Well, but maybe you don't. We didn't have that discipline. So we do all this Christmas stuff that we do because it's an obligation. We do it. It's, it's, it, it's not a real obligation, but it's, a, it's in your heart. You have to do it. You think that the Christmas thing, with all its expense and everything, and all its preparation, is something you must do. Then you're obligated to do that. Obligated to your family and friends. But the frenzy of it doesn't honor God. It doesn't. That frenzy, it's harmful to some people. You could have a heart attack worrying about being ready for Christmas. People in the store, you ready for Christmas? Oh, Christmas is coming. <laughs> is that what all this excitement is? I said that the other day. Are you ready? 
That's the big focus. You've got to be ready for Christmas. Got to have the presents wrapped in a tree up and the turkey ready to go and the ham. You've got to do all that and you're going to have a house full of people, which is a delight to have a house full of people. But some people give their tithes to Santa Claus. <laughs> some people give their tithes to Santa Claus. A tithe is a tenth of our income that we give to the support of our church. If you give it to Santa Claus, well, Santa Claus does, isn't going to bless you. He's just a dirty old elf. He's dirty from going down chimneys. If he was really going down chimneys, he'd be covered with soot. So that's why I say he's a dirty old elf. But I can remember my dad taking me to see Santa Claus in the pennies downtown in Dubois. I had to be maybe five years old. So I went through that thing, you know, to tell Santa what you want. We came out of the, we came out of pennies and there was Santa Claus walking around across the street. <laughs> And I thought, wait a minute. I figured it out. There's no Santa Claus. These are fakers. There's no Santa Claus. I figured it out for myself when I was five years old. It was kind of funny. But he's dead most of the year. Santa Claus only comes to life in December. <laughs> the retailers bring him to life. They really do. Carol and I, we never told our kids there was a Santa Claus. We didn't. We, these are pres presents are from you, and it's all about Jesus. We never, ever told our kids anything about there's a Santa Claus. Then we didn't have to reconcile the untruth with them when they found out. St. Nicholas, he really is dead. St. Nicholas of Myra Traditionally, he was born in 15 March of the year 270 and to 6 December 343. That's a long time ago, and he's dead. <laughs> he was known of D Nicholas of Bari. He was an early Christian bishop of Greek descent from the maritime city of Myra in Asia Minor, which is today's Turkey. And uh, he was during the time of the Roman Empire because of the many miracles that were attributed to him, he was also known as Nicholas the Miracle Worker. Saint Nicholas is the patron saint of sailors, merchants, archers, repentant thieves, children, brewers, pawnbrokers, unmarried people, and students in various uh, cities and countries around Europe. He's a patron saint of all those different things. His reputation evolved as Nick Nicholas the Pious, um, as was a common for early Christians and his legendary habit of secret gift giving. That's where the gift giving came about. The gifts were from St. Nicholas, who was a bishop and now is dead. The earliest accounts of his life were written centuries after his death and probably have some legendary elaborations. He is said to have been born in the Greek seaport of Patara in Asia Minor to wealthy Christian parents. In one of the earliest attested and most famous incidents from his life, <clears throat> he is said to have rescued three girls from being forced into prostitution by dropping a sack of gold coins through the window of their house each night for three nights so their father could pay a dowry for each one of them. Other early stories tell of him calming a storm at sea, saving three innocent soldiers from wrongful ex execution, and chopping down a tree possessed by a demon in his youth. He is said to have made a pilgrim pilgrimage to Egypt and Palestine. And um, shortly after his return, he became the Bishop of Myra, and he was later cast into prison during the persecution of, of um, Diocletian. There were 10 persecutions between Nero and Diocletian. But he was released after the accession, accession of Constantine, who, be, who turned uh, the, that part of the Roman Empire into a Christian empire. He accepted Christ. So we have all this anticipation. That's all about Santa Claus. But 
A lot of kids and adults are looking forward to Christmas morning in anticipation what kind of gift they're going to get. One time I found out where my mother had them all hidden and I very carefully unwrapped the paper so I knew what every one of them was already. <laughs> I don't know if I ever confessed that or not, but <laughs> I was a bit of a rascal when I was a kid. We anticipate getting together with a family. It's one of the few times that a whole family is together. It's an awesome thing when all your, I mean, we have three sons and uh, seven grandchildren and they don't fit all around our table anymore. But it's awesome to have them all together in one place. They joke and carry on, tell stories about their youth. We find out things we never knew. <laughs> But our family had to decide a couple of years ago that we're only going to give gifts to the children, that is our grandchildren, because the gifting was way out of hand. There were too many people. Everybody had a gift for everybody else, all the adults and all the kids, and it was too much. We just couldn't afford it, and neither could our kids could afford it. So we all decided together that we're just going to have a gift for the grandchildren. And um, next year, it's just going to be the grandchildren who are still in school, because the other ones are adults already, four of them. So, but you know, a lot of people are going to be disappointed. Disappointment happens. Some of them aren't going to get what they wanted what they expected and not what they think they deserve like the guy on that in that in that christmas story they show every year that wants their bb gun and his dad says you shoot your eye out <laughs> well uh, you know my dad said you'll shoot somebody else's eye out <laughs> I, that, that movie is so familiar to me but my dad said you'll shoot somebody's eye out and that movie you'll shoot your eye out but they're, they're, they might not get what they think they deserve. Some aren't able to travel and be with a family. I have a son in the Marine Corps in Camp Pendleton in California. I don't know if he's coming at Christmas time. I don't know. But I know he would be disappointed if he couldn't be with his, with his family. Disappointment comes when there are, you know, what, when what we anticipate doesn't happen disappointment happens when our expectations don't come true but God will never disappoint us when we anticipate his promises God won't disappoint us Santa Claus might our parents might our kids might but God won't disappoint us he won't ever as long as it's in his promises and his will Lamentations chapter 3, starting with verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them, and my, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. The one to the one who seeks him. That's where we have to put our hope and our trust. Not Santa Claus, but Jesus, the Lord. Amen. Now, here's a man who wasn't disappointed with his anticipation. His name is Simeon in the Bible. And it's Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord 
a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was a righteous and he was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. The consolation of Israel, meaning the Messiah. He was waiting. He was anticipating. The Jews were waiting. They were longing for their Messiah. They had the promises from the prophets that a Savior would come and deliver them from their enemies. Simeon wasn't waiting for presents. He wasn't waiting for Santa Claus. He wasn't waiting for his family and his friends. He was waiting for the promised Messiah. Like the prophecy in Micah chapter 5, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Verse 3, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. That was just one of the prophecies that the Messiah would come. Continuing then with Simeon in Luke chapter 2, Taking it up on, on verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms, praising God and saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So Simeon was not disappointed. He was waiting, anticipating, but he was not disappointed because he wasn't waiting for something that human beings can do. He was thrilled. God promised. God delivered. The promise was for Israel, and the promise was for the Gentiles. The Messiah was finally here. Now there's something to celebrate. I was trying to, I said earlier, I was trying to learn how to say Merry Christmas in Mandarin Chinese. Xing Dang Jie Kui Le. I learned that in the, in the gourmet buffet. Xing Dang Jie Kui Le. But that, that, Chinese is hard. So I was trying to learn that the other day um, online because I forgot how to say it from the restaurant I forgot, online. And the online instructor said that the Chinese people like to celebrate Christmas. They enjoy celebrating. They don't know why they're celebrating. They just enjoy the celebration. The instructor also said that Chinese Christians, to them it is especially important. But to the rest of them, it's just a celebration. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty it's getting that way in this country as well. It's a celebration, and it's about the celebration, and it's about the celebrators, and it's about the Christian, it's about the um, presence, and, and it's about the turkey, and it's about getting together with family. And those are all good things, but it pushes Jesus out of the way. In our culture, the reason for the season is known to all. The church is lift Jesus as a central figure of Christmas. But to the culture we live in, it seems like the celebration isn't much different from that of a communist culture. And there are places, you watch Fox News, where they don't want a Christmas tree because that's a threat to people that don't believe. They don't want Christmas tree. They want, you know, 
it's, it's, they're trying to turn everything upside down. But if it wasn't for the churches, Christmas would be a hollow celebration. Just celebration. It doesn't matter why. Just celebrate. It doesn't matter. So many around the world are Christian in name only. They celebrate, but it's about the trappings. It's not about the Savior. And that's sad. It's sad. It's up to us, real born-again believers, to keep the truth of the reason to celebrate in the public conscience. From the time of the first sin in the Garden of Eden, the world waited for the promised Messiah, for the one who would save us from having to suffer the punishment in the eternal lake of fire for our sins. And we all do them. We all were all sinners. So my sin earns for me a place in that fire, in that lake. But my Lord suffered, so I wouldn't have to do that. Christmas is almost here. I'm probably preaching this too late. But we can have a peaceful season. Stay focused on God. Don't let the excitement of the season pull you away from your devotional activities. Stay in the Word. Keep up your prayer life. Enjoy your family. Keep the gifts affordable. Don't use credit cards and strap yourself for a whole year. Don't give your tithes to Santa Claus. Be grateful to God for His perfect gift, the gift of salvation. Like Simeon, we have a reason to be joyful. So as we celebrate Christmas this year, let's keep our hearts, let's keep in our hearts a grateful attitude. We are blessed. We are so blessed that the, that the perfect eternal gift was Jesus himself. Born of a virgin. Laid in a manger. Last week I was talking about that, what manger probably was. And, that there, and it probably wasn't a stable. I was talking about that last week. But the fact is that he came. God sent his son and to, to suffer and die, to pay the price for my sins. And Paul said he was the worst of all sinners because he tried to destroy the church. And there are many now that try to destroy the church. And some of those people do get saved. Some of them do and give testimony and write books. Well, let's do that. Enjoy the family. Enjoy the turkey or the ham. Keep the gifts affordable. Don't give your tithes to Santa Claus. Be grateful for God's perfect gift. Out of a grateful heart, you know, bless other people. It's a, it's a blessing when you bless someone, right? Shawnee, I'm going to ask you to tell people what you were doing last Sunday. Shawnee wasn't here last Sunday. Tell people, tell people what you were doing. I went to Osceola. So they can hear you. I went to Osceola, the fire company, and um, our whole family, we played the elves while Santa was there. And it was so sweet. We gave the kids, we fed the kids, we gave them milk and cookies, and we gave them a gift. So it was really, really sweet. These kids were... A lot of you know the town of Osceola. You know they're just... Um, they just, they have it rough, some of them. So it was a lot of fun. It really was. Even my granddaughter dressed up as an elf. So it was like the whole family, and we spent the whole day. So it was nice. And you gave, but you got, but you got. Oh, yeah. You gave, but you were, but it was a joyful thing for you. Yeah, it was nice. It was really nice. Yeah, that's what we believers ought to be doing. Amen. Amen. You can miss church anytime you're being a blessing to somebody like that. <laughs> you have an official pardon. <laughs> what you saying?
we are amazingly blessed. Just look at some of the, you know, look at Ukraine. What kind of Christmas are those people having? We're just amazingly blessed. We have more than one outfit to put on. Some people don't have that. Some people don't have anything. And when I was a kid, even though I was blessed, I still wanted more things. I still had a hunger for more. But let's be blessed with what we have and share. Amen. Lord, we thank you today for the believers in this house. And we ask you to bless the ones that are not here. And we just, uh, you are so awesome, Lord. And all the honor and glory belongs to you. Not Santa Claus, not gifts, but you, because you gave us the perfect, precious gift of eternity. So we thank you with grateful hearts and pray that you help us to keep in that frame of mind, that gratitude attitude for the rest of this week, Lord. Dismiss us in your grace. Bring us back on Christmas Day, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.